نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل عقدتم من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعل لی وزیغ من اخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین اللہم الہمنا رشتا و عزنا من شروری انفسنا اللہم ارنا الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارنا الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ سورہ المائدہ This surah was revealed in Medina. It has 120 verses, 16 stanzas. It is the fifth by the order of arrangement and 112 by the order of revolution. This surah, we also can relate that it is the last surah of the first group of the surahs of Quran and is also the last Madani surah of the first group. Regarding the name of uh, Surah Al-Maida is from the verse number 112 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions how the followers of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, they requested him to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they may be given a Maida from, uh, from the heavens. And as far as the time period of uh, Surah Maida is concerned, we learned that it was revealed after the Treaty of Hadebiya. At the end of the sixth year of uh, immigration from Mecca to Medina and in the beginning of 7 AH. Uh, the events uh, which it follows is that in Zilhaj 6 AH, Prophet as was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so he accompanied with 1400 Muslims, he went to Mecca to perform Umrah. But the Quraysh, they were spurred by enmity and they prevented him from performance of his Umrah. And then there was, um, there was, although this was against, this was against all the ancient religious traditions of the Arabs, but still they stopped Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a treaty was signed between the Muslim and the Quraysh, according to which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, they were supposed to return. And then they were supposed to come the next year to perform Umrah. And uh, the continuity of the subject of the surah shows that most probably the whole of the surah was revealed as a single sitting. But uh, we do uh, come across the verses and we see that there were verses which were revealed at a later period also. So with this background, when it, the surah was revealed, the basic summary and the basic theme of the surah deals with basically the three topics. First is that um, when since now, since uh, Islamic uh, state has been made, has been created, and moreover, the power and the state authority of the Muslims has also been accepted by the people of Arab. So now here, Muslims are being given commandments and instructions about their religious, cultural, and political life of the Muslims. Like uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given definite rules and regulations regarding lawful and unlawful matters of eating and all the self-imposed foolish restrict restrictions of the pre-Islamic age, they have been abolished. Similarly, permission were given to Muslims to um, so that they could eat the food of the people of book. And the Muslim men, they've also been permitted to marry the women of uh, the people of book. And then there were there are rules and regulations of the three methods of purification, that is the performance of wudu, the bath of purification, and tayammum. And similarly, punishments for rebellion, disturbance of peace, and creating thefts, they have also been announced. And the drinking and gambling were forbidden. Expiation for breaking of oath was laid down. And then there were a few other orders and commandments and laws uh, regarding the different affairs of life of Muslims in an Islamic state. The second thing which we come across where in the verses of the Surah, Surah Al-Maida is that now uh, Muslims, since they had become a ruling body and an Islamic state of Medina had been established, so it was feared that the power might just corrupt the Muslims. So repeatedly over and over again, 
all the verses which have been uh, revealed during this period and also in Surah Maida, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered them to stick to justice and to guide against the, the wrong behavior of their predecessors, that is the people of the book. And Allah has also enjoined them to remain steadfast to the covenants of obedience to Allah and his messenger. So it is an admonition to the Muslims. And thirdly, there is uh, in the verses admonition to the Jews and the Christians also, because until uh, now, the Jews had been, the power of the Jews had been weakened and uh, all their settlements in the northern Arabia, they had come under the rule of Muslims. So they have been again warned about their wrong attitudes, about uh, Allah has negated all the wrong faith and beliefs they have fabricated. And they've been warned against their wrong attitudes and they've been invited to follow the right path towards which Prophet ﷺ had been inviting him. <clears throat> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhallazina amanu arufu bil urhud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who have believed, do what? Awfu bil uqood, fulfill all your contracts. <clears throat> so here we come across right at the start of Surah Al Maida without any introductory note. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately has given us at the start of Surah al maida a do of Qur'an, and that is what? Awfu bil uqud means what? Keeping of oaths, avoiding breach of pacts. So Allah orders that, oh, all you believers, you need to do what? You fulfill your contracts, keep your promises, fulfill your pledges or oaths, and avoid breaching any form of pacts. So this is how important fulfilling of promises and contracts is. Also in Surah Bani Israel, Allah says, masula, that there is absolutely no doubt that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold people accountable for all their pacts, their promises, their pledges, and their oaths. It is an attribute of Allah. Allah says, Inna Allah la yukhliful mi'ad. Allah says, Waman awfa bi ahdihi min Allah, who is more fulfilling of all forms of contracts other than Allah. And Allah does not, does not break the oath or the pledge. Similarly, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with his manners, we found, we find that he would always, he would always fulfill promises in all conditions, whatever they may be. For example, we learn here after the Treaty of Hadebia, after making a Treaty of Hadebia with the Quraysh, uh, when they had stopped Prophet Sallallahu from performing Umrah, and after, the, after signing the treaty, immediately when he had come back in his camp, there was a companion, Hazrat Abu Jandal. He had accepted Islam in Mecca, but he had he could not migrate to Medina, and he was held a captive by the Quraysh, and he was there he was uh, tortured and he was persecuted. And when he learned that Prophet Sallallahu had arrived in Mecca, somehow or the other, he managed to escape. And he came over to Prophet Sallallahu asking for help and asking for shelter. And we do learn by the traditions that he was all injured with blood coming out of his wounds, dripping out of his wounds. And he had all, he had all the handcuffs and he was like tied and there were signs of all form of torture on his body. And he called out for help and protection. But you know what Prophet Salavasim did? Even it was, it was heartbreaking for the companions also. Prophet Salavasim asked him to go back. He told him that he will have to return him because in the Treaty of Hadebia, they had signed, the Muslims had signed with the Quraysh that if, it, if a person escaped from or ran away from the people of Mecca and came over to the people of Medina, the Muslims of Medina, they will be, according to Treaty of Hadebia, they will be duty bound to hand over the person back to the people of Quraysh. So Prophet Salaam said, what? Abu Jandal, you will have to return because I have made a treaty. 
this was a treaty with whom this was a treaty with the with the disbelievers with the idol worshipers who had filled up the haram with 360 idols and this was a treaty with all those who had failed to believe the invitations of prophet sallallahu this was a treaty and a pact with those who had forced prophet sallallahu and the companions out of mecca these were those who were stopping Prophet Sallallahu to perform Umrah. These were those who were who were all the all those who were persecuting and who had persecuted and tortured the Muslims just because they were saying, Qalu Rabbunallah. So a treaty with these Quraysh of Mecca and the condition that if if the oath was fulfilled and a Muslim was returned. How would they relate to him? How would they behave with? The torture would be ultimate now. And it, it also meant that he might be put to death. So despite all the risks and despite all the hardships and despite with whom the treaty and the pact was made, Prophet Sallallahu laid down the moral and laid down the manner for the whole of the Ummah that the treaty, the promise, the pact, may it be with anyone may it be with even the bitterest of enemies once a pact and promise is made it will not be broken it will not be broken there will be no breach of pact once it has been decided we need to think and put our minds before we make a promise and a note but once we have then whatever it may be with whoever it may be and whatever may be this complication and the repercussions and however difficult it may be, but it has to be fulfilled. Similarly, we, we, get, we come across another incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu when two of the companions, Hazrat Josefa bin Yaman accompanied with his father, they were emigrating from Mecca to Medina and on their way, they were stopped by the Quraysh of Mecca and they would not let him let them continue going to Medina, but they made a promise and they made a promise with the Quraysh of Mecca that if they let them proceed with their immigration to Medina, then they would, the people of Quraysh, they made them make the promise and the pledge that if they reached Medina, they will not fight with the Muslims against the Quraysh. And they will not join the army of the Muslims against the Quraysh. So readily they agreed and they made the promise because they were so desirous they had an intense desire to reach Medina and see prophet sallallahu so they were allowed by the Quraysh and they left uh, they were left alone and they immigrated and they reached Medina but when they reached Medina and they met prophet sallallahu they learned that there was an army being uh, prepared to fight the Quraysh of Mecca, the army of Abu Jahl, which was proceeding from Mecca towards Medina. Now, after immigration and reaching Medina, they showed desire and in, uh, in the desire and inclination to join the Muslim army also. They had already narrated the events of their immigration, telling Prophet Sallallahu of the promise they had made with the Quraysh. You know what Prophet Salaam said? Prophet Salaam instructed them to keep their promise, to keep their promise with the Quraysh. There were just 313 Muslims who were going to face one an army of 1,000 of Abu Jahl in Badr. But how direly were fighting hands needed and how short was the Muslim army? How few were the Muslim soldiers and how much were the Muslim army needing in need of Muslim soldiers? But under these situations, with whom was the promise made? And despite when the promise would be fulfilled, the Muslims would obviously be at a loss of four fighting hands. But despite that, Prophet Sallallahu asked them to fulfill their promise and stay back in Medina. So this is it. This is how important fulfilling of contracts and keeping of promises and pledges is. And we learn the manner of Prophet Sallallahu even before prophethood. Hazrat Himsa bin Abi Himsa, he uh, explains that Prophet Sallallahu had made a business transaction with him and there was some that there was some payment to be made which was due and a promise prophet made a promise that he will make the due payment 
and uh, he asked him to stay at a place but uh, Hazrat Himsa Vinavi Himsa says that I went away to the city and I forgot and when I passed by the same place where the promise had been made regarding the payment of uh, payment, uh, the giving up the payment, I saw the Prophet still after three days. After three days and three nights, Prophet was still at the same place. This was the manner of Prophet regarding the fulfilling of promises and pacts, even before, even before prophethood. So this is. Remember, that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions as the trait of believers in Quran. In Surah Mu'minun, Allah says, وَلَّزِينَ لِأَمَانَتِهِمْ وَأَحْدِهِمْ رَعُونَ Mu'min, the believers, are those who take care of their promises and their entrusted things. And it is the trait of hypocrites that they break, they break their promises and they do not fulfill their promises and oaths. It has been reported in Bukhari and Muslim that Prophet said, Ayatul Munafiku Ruba'a. There are four signs of a hypocrite. Is a hadasa qazaba. That when he talks, when he converses, when he uh, makes a conversation, he tells a lie. That he is what? He is a liar. Is a hadasa qazaba. Is a ahada akhlafa. Then when he makes a promise, he makes an oath, a pledge, he breaks it. He does not fulfill it. Is that tumana, khana, when he is entrusted with something, he is not trustworthy. Is a khosama, fajara, that when he ends up in a fight, he is he is ill-mannered or he uses abusive language. Is a khosama, fajara. And we learn in Muslim, the Prophet added, despite the fact, even if he if he establishes salah and he is offering zakat, if he has these five, four traits, then he is what? He has signs of hypocrisy. Allahumma tawakhir qalbi min an nifaki. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all realize the importance, realize the importance of, of uh, promises and pledges in our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the properties, the traits and manners of piety and of virtue in Surah, in Surah Baqarah and says, mufuna bi ahdihim iza ahadu, that they fulfill their promises when they make a pact or when they make a promise. Remember, as we learn from traditions, that Prophet said that the, pro, that the person who breaks his promise, a flag will be appointed on his head on the day of judgment. And the more there are the breach of facts, the more there will be the flags which will be appointed above his head to highlight, to indicate, to show all that this was the person he, who never used to fulfill his promises. Oaths and promises, they extend in the whole of our lives. How many people, they make promises in their life and how different people are promising and making pledges in their life. Like a teacher, a teacher promises the parents to teach their children in return of the fee he is charging them. But remember that if the teacher just keeps on chatting on the mobile and uh, calls the children for extra classes also and charges extra for that also this is being all what this is being this is being this is not being trustworthy this is failing to fulfill the promise and the pact also similarly a doctor a doctor promises a patient that a surgeon uh, promises his patient that he will perform his surgery but despite, despite the heavy charges and the heavy fees he's going to charge, the surgeon just keeps on sitting in the surgeon room, sipping his cup of coffee and letting the junior doctor performs the surgery of the patient. This is what? This is not keeping or fulfilling the promise. And this is also not being trustworthy also. Then there is always a promise. When a person employs and there is always a promise between the employee and the employer that the employer says that if you give me such and such services and you extend to me such and such of your labor for such and such hours of your service i shall pay you this decided i shall pay you this decided amount between the two of us so now if the employee doesn't come up with the decided work he, he was supposed to put in, the decided hours 
or the employer doesn't give the decided payment after receiving the full labor, then this is what? This is, this is a breach of pact. This is not fulfilling of promises. So we need to realize how important it is that wherever, whenever, with whomsoever, we make a promise, we need to be mindful of it. Before making a promise, we need to decide and we nearly, we clearly need to realize whether we can fulfill the promise or not. But once it has been made, we have to fulfill the promise and we have to be very mindful and sensitive about our promises. And then beyond that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, lawful for you are what? Bahimatul an'am, the animals of grazing livestock, except for that which is recited to you in this Quran. Hunting not being permitted while you are in the state of ihram. Indeed, Allah ordains what he intends. So in this verse number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing uh, the eating of all forms of bahimatul an'am, that is the grazing livestock, they have been permitted for Muslims to be Eaten. By hadith, we have learned the additional words of from where we can derive a, a further explanation regarding what, uh, what form of grazing livestock they are permissible for us. And we learn from these from the words of hadith that all forms of birds, all birds which are herbivorous birds like the hen, sparrow, the duck, the geese, they are halal and permissible. But all carnivorous birds like the eagle, the bat, the crows, etc., they are not permissible. And similar is for animals. All animals which are halal are the herbivorous animals like the cow, the goat, the sheep, the camel, etc. But the carnivorous animals, on contrary to that, they are not permissible. They are haram like the lion, the tiger, the fox, the bear. And uh, all these are because they are carnivores. They are not halal and they are not permissible. <clears throat> Similarly, regarding seafood. There are some scholars, according to some schools of thoughts, they take all forms of seafood halal. But uh, the most of the opinion, most of the scholars are of the opinion that as for school, seafood also, the herbivorous uh, sea animals, uh, they are marine animals, they are halal, and the carnivorous ones of them are also not lawful to be consumed. So the whale... The whale, a huge whale will be considered halal, but on contrary, the carnivorous shark fish is considered as haram. And similarly, we learn from here that hunting will also not be permitted while in haram. Where, uh, we will be definitely talking about this in a greater detail in a later verse of Surah Maida. <coughs> Verse number two, O you who have believed, do not violate the rights of Allah or the sanctity of the sacred months or neglect the markings of the sacrifice, uh, sacrificial animals and garlanding them or violate the safety of those coming to the sacred house, seeking bounty from their Lord and his approval. But when you come out of Ehram, then you may hunt and do not let the hatred of a people for having obstructed you from Masjid Haram lead you to transgress and cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is severe in penalty. So now in this uh, verse number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving some few, uh, some other commandments regarding uh, regarding the Muslim life also. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering, number one, Allah is guiding all the Muslims. The most important order here is, in the last part of the verse is that Allah guides the Muslims that after, after they were stopped from performing Umrah, they should not cross the limits. They should not cross the limits 
in being revengeful, as Allah also mentions in Surah Baqarah, that you should not transgress. You are furious, you are angry, and you might tend to be revengeful towards the people of Quraysh. But in all these manners, you need to stay within the prescribed and the ordered and the enjoined limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, this verse also gives instructions regarding the style of mutual help for the Muslims. Allah says, وَلَا تَعَابَنُوا وَلِلْإِسْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ وَلَا تَعَابَنُوا وَلِلْإِسْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And Allah orders, تَعَابَنُوا وَلِلْبِرِّ وَالْتَّقْوَى That Muslims will cooperate with each other with all those acts, with all those activities which are pious which are righteous, all deeds and activities of piety, Muslims will cooperate with each other. May it be a stranger or may it be a relative, a friend or a total outsider. And the second is, This is a don't of Quran regarding our manner of cooperating and helping and supporting others. Allah says that you will refrain. You have to refrain and stay away for, from helping any activity, any manner, any behavior, any, any form of activity which is sinful, which is sinful or which is in any form of disobedience and transgression to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May it be carried on by your near and dear ones, by the relatives, by your even your siblings, if they are indulging in sin, in any of such sinful activities and any transgressions, then you will not help them, you will not support them, you will not protect them, and you will not assist them. So these are the two, uh, this is a do and adorned for all the believers, for all of us regarding extension of cooperation and mutual help. Verse number three. Prohibited to you are all dead animals, the blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to other than Allah. And those animals which were killed by strangling or by a violent blow or by a headlong fall, or by the goring of horns, and those from which a wild animal has eaten, except what you are able to slaughter before its death, and all those which are sacrificed on stone altars, and prohibited is that you seek decision through divining arrows. So, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a complete list of hurrimat alaykum, that is all the things which are strictly prohibited, which are to the minest and to the finest of details with perfection they have been declared unlawful for Muslims to be consumed. So the verse gives instruction about the food which is unlawful or prohibited for the consumption by Muslims. In the list, the top of the list is al maitatu all forms of dead animals. The reason obviously very clearly being that the dead animals we find dead, they might have rotted or putrefied, their bodies might have rotted or putrefied, and the animal might have died because of some severe infection, a harmful infection, or obviously because of some poison which if ingested or consumed by a person will be harmful for the body itself. And the dead body is a very good medium for the growth of the germs and the microorganisms. So that is why <clears throat> and these are different reasons why consuming of dead animals, al has been considered unlawful. But Prophet ﷺ has been reported in a tradition that he said that only two dead things are permissible, the seafood and the locust. The seafood is uh, permissible without, uh, even when found dead, because they, number one, they are cold-blooded. And secondly, immediately when they're taken out of water, they just die. And the locusts, they are tiny birds, and they are caught in nests. And the moment they get entrapped in the nest, they are so tiny that they are suffocated to death. And it is like next to impossible to get hold 
of each one of them and to slaughter them or to do zabiha for each one of them. So these two dead things found without slaughtering, they are permissible. The second thing is adamu, all forms of blood, because uh, we can scientifically relate today that it is a source of infection. It can be, it is the one of the best mediums for the growth of germs and the microorganisms. And uh, taking in meat, which has blood in it, well, as we learn from scientific investigations and researches today, we find out that consuming milk, uh, meat with blood staying in it will lead to food allergies and different form of diseases inside the human body. So uh, milk, uh, the, uh, the blood has to be removed by the method of slaughtering the animals. But we do learn from traditions that Prophet Salaam said that all forms of blood in the flesh is prohibited except the spleen and liver. These are the two organs of the body which are basically made up of blood. So th these two are permissible. The third thing which Allah has mentioned here is the flesh of the swine, lahmul qansir, the flesh and the, <clears throat> the flesh of swine. We learn that uh, we can relate that it is prohibited to consume the flesh of swine because of um, the bad traits of the swine itself. It is an extremely filthy animal. We learn that it even when when the pig it is hungry and it has nothing to eat, it even eats its own excreta, its own wastes. The second thing is it is an extremely selfish animal. The mother, the female, when it is hungry, doesn't have an, doesn't have anything else to eat, will eat its babies also. And the last is that it is a very vulgar animal. It is a highly vulgar animal. The swine, the pig is the only animal, it's the only animal of all the animals and the birds which indulges in physical relationship with the same sex also. <coughs> So we can relate that consuming the animal, the meat of the animal having this, all these bad traits will in fact indirectly affect the, affect the temperament and the manners and the morals of the people who are consuming the meat also. And the third thing, the fourth thing which has been uh, made unlawful is So twice in two statements has in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negated all forms of food which has been dedicated to other than Allah. All forms of foods dedicated to other than Allah, may, may it be all those animals which were sacrificed on the, on the stone altars of the idols to please them, or any a form of animal which has been de uh, dedicated to any form other than Allah, they have been made prohibited here. Why? Because this is major polytheism in the rites and the worships of Allah. And uh, to avoid all these four uh, 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 things that uh, we've been explained here, to avoid all of these prohibited things, Muslims, they have been enjoined the method of Zabiha for slaughtering of animals. And what this method of Zabiha is, we have been taught by the teachings of Hadith and Sunnah, the steps which we... <coughs> We learn our, that is the recitation of Bismillah and Bismillah Allahu Akbar. This will rule out all forms of dedications to any, any deity other than Allah. And this will rule out all forms of Ghair Allah. And the second step is to cut the throat of the animal. And in this step, we have been instructed by Hadith that we cut the major vessel of one side of the neck. And because of the stab, what happens is the animal experiences severe pain and the body of the animal jerks. And when the body of the animal jerks, the muscle pump of the body of the animal operates and the whole of the blood, it flows out through the major vessel, the jugular vein, which has been cut in the neck, the whole of the body, uh, the whole of the blood drains out slowly. And this has uh, the jerking of the body assists in draining of all the blood from the, all the muscles and all the meat of the body of the animal. And finally, when the blood, blood drains away, the animal collapses and the animal dies. 
So this is the method of slaughtering the animal which has been specified for all the Muslim slaughtering is. So by this method, neither the animal will be Allah, nor, nor there would be any Adamu, or nor it will be what? Nor it will be Al-Maytatu. So all requirements will be met with in the list of Hurrimat Alaykum. And um, despite this method being ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find that non-Muslims, they come up criticizing. They come up criticizing that Muslims, they are sadists and uh, they um, are very hard hearted and they are very harsh. And even look at them, that even when they slaughter their animals, they cut their half of throat and they let it, they let, just let it uh, in a state of pain and agony and they torture their uh, animals also, these Muslims, they are hard hearted, brutal beasts. They are hardly, they are hardly Muslims. So um, this is all an accusation on the Muslims. And you know what? There was a research. There was a research which was conducted in Germany by, Prof by Professor Schulz. And the purpose of the research was to prove how painful the whole process of zabiha, of slaughtering in Islam is for the animals. So they, they took about a series of animals were taken, like, um, like goats, they were taken, and uh, implants were made, electrodes were implanted on the brain and the heart to record the ECG and to record the EEG movements to see the brain movements and the condition of the heart of the animals. And these animals, then they were, uh, they were killed in different methods, like they were electrocuted or their, their, their head was just cut off by, um, uh, and they were cut off or they were shot with a um, gun, different, and then they were slaughtered by the process of Zabiha as instructed to the Muslims. So by the EEG brain recordings and by the ECG, the heart recordings, what they found out was that once the animal was killed by a process of zabiha and slaughter, there was an immediate instant, <coughs> there was one sharp stab of pain. There was an intense swear, one sharp stab of pain, but following this, there was no pain and there was no discomfort for the animal and the whole blood also came out while the heart stayed pump. The heart was pumping, the brain was working and slowly the blood was coming out. So. Finally, with the research, they came to the conclusion that this was the most comfortable process for the animal as well. And moreover, the whole of the blood of the body also came out. And this was the most beneficial and safe uh, method for the human beings as well. This is Allah. And these are the orders of Allah Rabbul Alameen, who is the creator of all the beings. And so the orders which he gives are obviously the best for all his creations. He is Rahman, he is Ar Rahim, and he is Al Wadud. <coughs> the next thing which has been uh which has been uh, made uh Unlawful here and haram here is what? Antastaksimu bil azlam. That you seek decisions through divining arrows. Now, what were these aslam were that the Arabs they used these aslam, they were long sticks and they had head like the arrows. And what the Arabs used to do them or uh, use them the way was that they used to throw these arrows and they used. To, they, they used to use them for two purposes. Number one, for making decisions of dividing things. And the second was to make future predictions or to help them guide for decisions of their future. Now, today, we do not have these uh, divining arrows or we do not use these spears for these two things. But remember, the two things for which they were used for, they are still, they will be considered unlawful. So the first thing is, <coughs> the first thing which we will be, uh, which we will regard unlawful will be, what will be all forms of uh, lucky dips, lucky dips, lucky draws, raffle tickets, prize bonds, etc. They will all be decided as, unlawful according to this verse of Surah Al-Maidah.
because they have been by what by by lucky drips by drawing lots they have been decided so all things which are which have been decided by drawing lots may it be i repeat lucky dips lucky draws raffle tickets prize bonds all will be according to this verse of surah maida they will be hurrimat alaikum they have been strictly considered unlawful the basic reason which i can comprehend in the wisdom of pro uh, prohibiting all these things is that it is we can logically understand that a person who is wealthy and who is rich will obviously as far as like uh, these lucky drips and the prize bonds is concerned just giving an example to make you understand the wisdom of this uh, law uh, of this uh, thing uh, which has been considered as unlawful is imagine a person who is wealthy obviously he will buy off a huge number of uh, the prize bonds in contrast to a person who is just like hand to mouth will maximum be able to buy a few one two or 10 prize bonds so now if we compare statistically the chances of winning the prize will be obviously much more by the wealthy person so what is happening is money begets money money begets money and wealthy person will go on getting wealthier and the richer person will go on getting richer and the person who will be obviously winning the prize in all these conditions of lucky dips or lucky draws or prize bonds they will have nothing <clears throat> will have nothing regarding his work his effort his struggle his um, his labor or in fact his knowledge or his skill will have nothing to do it it will be what money will be begetting money and it will be wealth will which will be attracting more wealth the person who is rich will go on getting richer and the person who is poorer will be deprived of the wealth in this condition so this is like this is not fair and secondly the money the person is going to get in form of this reward is going to be easy money is going to be easy money and it is going to be an unlawful earning so the easy unlawful earning the way it comes easily is also spent easily for all forms of transgressions for all unlawful things for exhibition for demonstration for show off for riya so this is why which i understand with my minimal uh, comprehension the wisdom of why these things have been prohibited and made unlawful however we do realize that drawing out lots to um, making draws for decision of uh, equal rights to make that being a very fair manner of decision deciding between people of equal rights we can make draws like prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he had to leave madina and he wanted to decide that who out of the wives would accompany him in his travel he used to draw he used to make draws so this is permissible to decide among the people of equal right and the second thing which is being made unlawful according to this verse is all things regarding future predictions future predictions may it be through sun signs the stars the horoscopes the knowledge of astrology or palm mystery whatever it is it is all what it is hurrimat alaikum according to this verse number 3 of surah al maida and also regarding uh, it is polytheism it is polytheism in the rights and in the attributes of allah subhanahu wa taala so it is a major sin indulging in any form of future predictions indulging in any form of future prediction by whatever means is what it is a major sin it is unlawful and it is polytheism of um, it is polytheism it is a major polytheism as has been reported in a tradition that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that a person who visits a sorcerer or a future teller and confirms in what he says he disbelieves in what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has conveyed so the person who is confirming what a future teller tells him and accepts what he tells him is what is a disbeliever according to the words of this hadith similarly prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has also warned all of us in a tradition that a person who pays a visit to the one who is giving information regarding the future predictions 
the salah of that person for 40 days will not be accepted. The salah of that day of that person will not be accepted. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let us refrain from all forms of information, indulging in any form of information for the future. Because remember, the knowledge of future Ghaib is for whom? The realm of Ghaib is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Alimul Ghaib. He is Allahul Ghayub. And anyone wanting to get into the information of future is definitely doing something which is haram, which is forbidden, which is unlawful, and also is indulging in a form of major polytheism. <coughs> <coughs> And in the last part of the verse, Allah says, Al Yauma Akmal to Lakum Dinukum, but at Mam to Alekum Nermati, Warazi to Lakumul Islam Adina. Allah is saying that this day I have perfected for you. Allah says, No, I go be uh, behind that. Allah says, This day. All those who disbelieve have despaired of defeating your religion. So fear them not, but fear me. This day I have perfected for you your religion and completed my favor upon you and have approved for you Islam as a religion. But whoever is forced by severe hunger with no inclination to sin, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. <coughs> So here in this verse, the last part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in one, this is one of the last verses of Quran which was revealed. And um, this was revealed uh, during the last Hajj, the farewell Hajj and pilgrim of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have learned, was revealed these last verses before the last sermon of the farewell of the, the farewell sermon of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is clearly announcing that I have atmam tu, I have perfected your religion. Because the teachings of Quran and the teachings of Hadith and Sunnah, they are to the minutest of details. To the minutest of details, they are a complete and a perfect and a, a complete and a perfect guidance for all spheres of life. For all spheres of life, they are a complete and a perfect and a perfected guidance. And then Allah has used two words, akmaltu and atmamtu. They means what? That teachings of Quran, they are perfect and they are complete to the finest of details, both in quality and quality. Atmamtu and akmaltu refer that the teachings of Quran are perfect regarding quantity and quality also, all spheres and to the finest of details. And there, uh, in the last part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is permitting that uh, the things which have been considered made and declared uh, unlawful for you, they are uh, permitted if somebody is forced by hunger and uh, with no inclination to sin. Forced by hunger means that the person, there is threat of the person. The person doesn't have anything to eat. The person just does not have anything to eat. And if he does not, he just has available unlawful food. And if like a dead animal or the food or, or the flesh of swine, that is like happens to be the only thing that is available for provision for that person and has nothing else to eat. And if the person does not consume this unlawful food, there is chances that the person might seriously fall sick or the person might just pass away. So under these conditions, when there is severe hunger, this by no means does this imply to a person going around, see the world tour or just going around Europe and having 101 other forms of foods available, like a person going around seeing America or seeing Europe and uh, not finding lawful food, lawful uh, slaughtered animals not available, but the person obviously has all forms of dairy products or baked stuff or confectioneries or biscuits and 
there may be, there will be available all forms of fruits and vegetables and there will be marine animals and there will be seafood, halal seafood available also. And then plus there will be pulses and there will be, there will be 101 other forms of foods available which are within the lawful, uh, lawful limits prescribed by Quran and Hadith. So a person going around seeing America or going around in a in an enjoyable trip, if does not come across any halal meat, then that is no permission to go on eating that, and that is no forced conditions. And similarly, the person in severe hunger is permitted to eat this unlawful food, provided the person does not have inclination to sin. They should, in hearts of hearts, there has to be sincerity for obedience, and the person should not be consuming this out of sin, out of sin, and should also not be a transgressor. That the person should eat only as much which is needed to save the person's life, and should not go on indulging once the person indulges once, should not go on insisting on committing the sinful, unlawful limits also. <coughs> Verse number four, they ask you what has been made lawful for them. Say lawful for you are all good foods. That is the game caught by whatever you have trained of hunting animals, which you train as Allah has taught you. So eat of whatever of what they catch for you and mention the name of Allah upon it and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is swift in account. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that all the good food is lawful for you. So this is because, you know, when uh, a list of a list of unlawful foods was suggested, then they were asked that what is lawful for us? So Allah has told that they, you have been given a brief list of unlawful foods. And other than that brief list, the rest of all the things are lawful for Muslims to be consumed in their food. And here Allah in this verse is also explaining that hunting is permissible for Muslims also. <coughs> This hunting may it be by hunting animals or hunting animals, trained animals or birds or weapons of hunt, any method, it will be permissible for Muslims provided according to the orders explained here. We learn by the, from this verse and also by traditions of Prophet ﷺ that the hunter, that the hunter before he releases the trained animal, the trained uh, hunting bird, or any weapon of hunt, like that is before uh, firing or before releasing uh, an arrow. So before the hunter releases the bird, the animal, or the weapon of hunt, like shooting of the gun, the hunter should recite Bismillah, similar to the Bismillah, which has to be recited while slaughtering the animals. So the hunter should recite Bismillah. And if the hunter recites Bismillah, and then even if the person finds the hunt dead, then it will be halal. But if the hunt is found alive, then the person has to perform Zabiha by saying Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. And uh, however, the verse clearly announces that if the animal is found dead without slaughtering, it can be consumed because Bismillah was recited before, the, before releasing the bird, the animal, or the weapon of hunt. Verse number five, this day, all good foods have been made lawful and all the food of those who were given the scripture is lawful for you also. And uh, for you, uh, for, um, is lawful for you and your food is lawful for them. And lawful in marriage are chaste women from among the believers and chaste women from among those who were given scriptures before you. When you have given them their due compensations, desiring chastity, not unlawful sexual relationship or taking secret lovers and whoever denies the faith, his work has become worthless and he in hereafter will be be among the losers. So in this verse number five, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us more than one orders and commandments. The first is that Allah is allowing that the food of the people, all the food of the people of the book is permissible 
for the Muslims, provided it has all the halal and it has all the permissible things on their tables. So the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, if they on their dining table, while they are serving as like hosts to the Muslims, if they have all the food which is within the permissible and the lawful uh, lawful limits described by Quran and Hadith, then Muslims, they can eat from the table of the people of the book. So this is permissible. And we need to remember that on contrary to that, if the table of a Muslim, if a table of the Muslim, he is a host, but the table of the Muslim host happens to have a haram item, like their, their drink is being served, or there is the, uh, the flesh of swine being served, then this will be what? Even eating on that table will not be permissible for the Muslims also. So the merit is what? That the food which is being presented should be within the limits, the halal and the haram limits explained and enjoined by Quran and Hadith. The second thing which we are learning from this verse is that it is permissible for the Muslim men. It is permissible for the Muslim men to marry a, Mus a woman of the people of the book. That is a Muslim man when under a difficult situation that cannot find a Muslim woman, he can get married and have nikah with the with a woman of uh, from the Jews or from the Christians, and this is permissible according to the teachings of Quran and Hadith. But remember, the Muslim women remember. But this, when Muslim men they are allowed to marry the Jew women or the Christian women, is also provided they can. They can uh, provided when they have no other option, and uh, they provided they can be extremely mindful and they can be extremely uh, protective about the religion of their own selves and also about their religion, about their children also. And the next thing which we need to remember is that the Muslim women, Muslim women, they are not allowed to marry the Jew or the Christian men, and. In this verse, the permission has been only granted to the Muslim men. And similarly, uh, we need to understand also that when a Muslim man marries a Jew or a Christian woman, then it is mandatory. Here it will be mandatory to give her the bride's gift or the dower also. And even marrying the non-Muslim, the people of the book, marrying the Jew or the Muslim, uh, the Christian women, even then the purpose will be not to have any form of extramarital relationship. And the purpose will be to maintain chastity. And even the Christian and the Jew women, they will be given their uh, enjoined haq mahar also. So this explains the importance of all these things of uh, giving the haq mahar to the wife at the time of nikah and to make the nikah and to carry on the marriage with the purpose of uh, staying connected in marriage and the purpose will not be just to have physical relationship and then there will be no form of relationship secret relationship with even the non-muslim women for the muslim men remember our religion islam does not allow any form of secret marriage also announcement of nikah Announcement of nikah with the sunnah of walima is a basic prerequisite for nikah. Walima is a basic prerequisite for nikah. And one of the purposes of walima is an announcement of the nikah. So in Islam, Muslims are not even allowed to have a secret marriage. So if so even if a secret nikah is not permitted in Islam, then how will, how will it be permissible to have any form of secret relationships like telephonic conversation or chattings or video calls or messagings or datings, flirtings, secret living ins, nothing is, nothing is permissible in Islam and they are strictly prohibited. All forms of secret relationships between the men and Muslim women are strictly prohibited and they are unlawful. And this is, this is against the Islamic mode of ethics and the Islamic code of ethics. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all maintain our modesty and maintain our levels of moral ethics which have been uh, which have been made uh, which have been commanded in Quran and according to the teachings of hadith verse number six Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly explains in these verses the orders regarding the purification of the different methods of purification as explained in Quran and Hadith. Allah says, O oh, you who have believed when you rise to perform prayer, wash your faces and your forearms to the elbows and wipe over your head, uh, wipe over your heads and wash your feet to the ankles. And if you are in a state of impurity that is janaba then purify yourselves with what with a bath but if you are ill or on a journey or one of you comes from the place of relieving himself or you have contacted women and do not find water then seek clean earth and wipe over your faces and hands with it allah does not intend to make difficulty for you but he intends to purify you and complete his favor upon you that you may be grateful the next step of purification which i would be talking briefly about is the bath the bath of purification the bath of the purification becomes obligatory when, number one, when there is a physical relationship or a sexual relationship between the husband and the wife, or in case of emission, or when the woman is over with her menstrual cycle, that is the vaginal bleeding of her monthly cycle, or when she is over with her postpartum bleeding, then in these two conditions also to acquire purification, she needs a bath of purification. And also when a person gives bath to a dead person, it is preferable and it is advisable and it is better if the person, if available situations in time before the salah, he or she should take a bath preferably, but a minimum of performing wuzu is needed in this condition. Now, in brief, summing up from more, a lot of hadith from Bukhari and Muslim, I would the bath of the purification as proven by the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, as reported by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and in many of the hadith I would mention stepwise is first of all voiding. After voiding, washing the private parts and then to wash the hands. After washing the hands, the wudu will be performed like a normal manner. Normal routine, the steps of wudu, they will perform in the normal manner. And after the completion of the wudu, the person is supposed to wash the hair. And the hair, as proven by Sunna, can be washed in various methods. Like either the whole of the head can be washed three times, making sure pouring water and rubbing with the hands, ensuring that even the root of a single hair doesn't stay dry. The whole of the head can be washed thrice or the hair can be divided into two parts, the left and the right, and we can wash the right part first thrice and then we can wash the left part thrice or the whole head can be, the whole hair can be divided into three parts, the central part, the left and the right part, and the three parts, the first, the central part is washed thrice, and then the right part is washed thrice, and then the left part is washed thrice. This is, these are the different methods the Prophet he adopted, and it can be any one of all of these. And dividing different parts is to ensure perfection, and to ensure that we are so careful in dividing parts that none of the hair will be left dry. And after washing the hair, then uh, water is poured over the body and continuously the person is rubbing and scrubbing to ensure that all the folds of the body and all the hidden parts of the body and all the hair of the body are completely wet and not a single hair of the body or a root of the single hair of the body stays dry. 
and moving our nose pins and moving our rings and moving our uh, earrings or our tops to ensure that the whole of the skin gets moist. And this can also be like first we can wash the left half of the body, the front of the left half, then we can attend and concentrate and focus towards the back of the left half uh, of the right. First, the front of the right half and then the back of the right half and then the front uh, left half front and the back of the left half and dividing the body into different parts again is to ensure that we are very careful and we are very sensitive just attending to one part at a time so that neglect is just ruled out. And then after washing the whole body, the person, according to Sunnah, will get aside, will step aside and then wash the feet. The feet could have also been washed uh, as when we were performing the wudu or they could be just postponed and they were not washed with the wudu. Then after complete, completion of the wudu and completion of the bath, the person steps aside that is where the person was sitting or standing the person gets to one side and there the feet are washed last of all so these are the different steps which are in detail stepwise according to sunnah verse number seven and remember the favor of allah upon you and his covenant with which he bound you when you said we hear and we obey Samirna wa atwana and fear allah indeed allah is knowing of that within the breast O you who have believed be persistently standing firm for allah witnesses injustice and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just be just that is nearer to the righteousness and fear allah indeed allah is acquainted with what you do allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking all of us to be what to be fair and just in our worldly dealings with all those around us allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is what he has an attribute he is al adil and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was so fair he was so just we learn from incidents of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life that once there was a fight regarding an issue of the distribution of water in the cultivated lands between Prophet Sallallahu paternal cousin and a Jew. And the Jew was on the right and Prophet Sallallahu was very fairly gave a just decision in favor of the Jew against his own cousin. Similarly, we learn that there was a woman from Banu Makhdum. She committed uh, theft and she was from the leader of the tribe. And uh, the whole uh, event, the case had been presented to Prophet Sallallahu And he was about to announce the punishment that the uh, woman was uh, interceded. Uh, Hazrat Osama bin Zayd, who, who was the beloved adopted son of Prophet Sallallahu He was an adopted grandson of Prophet Sallallahu So Hazrat uh, Osama bin Zayd, who came and he interceded for this uh, lady of Banu Makhdum. And the Prophet Sallallahu was so furious that his face became red and he stood up. And he said, he announced clearly, he said that you should not, you should refrain from adopting the manner of the previous people, the people of the previous books. They used to, they used to give punishments to their lords class of the society. And they used to, they never used to give punishments to the elite of the society. And then Prophet Salaisim said that by Allah, remember that a, a a law and an order of the Quran, which is fairly and with implemented with justice, is more useful and productive than uh, the reigning of continuous downpour for 40 days. And then Prophet ﷺ further added by Allah, if Fatima bint Muhammad وسلم, had committed theft, then I would have ordered that her hands be cut off also. <clears throat> so this was the justice and this was the fear dealing of Prophet 
Allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds that for them is forgiveness and great reward. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wal-tuqa wal-arfafa wal-ghina. But those who disbelieve and deny our signs, those are the companions of hellfire. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Prophet Sallallahu has informed all of us that a person who seeks forgiveness and who asks for release and escape from hellfire thrice, then the hellfire itself intercedes for the person to be released from hell. O oh, you who have believed, remember the favor of Allah upon you. When a people determined to extend their hands in aggression against you, but he withheld their hands from you and fear Allah and upon Allah let the believers rely. Verse number 12. And Allah had already taken a covenant from the children of Israel that, and we delegated from among them 12 leaders. And Allah said, I am with you. Allah promised the people of Bani Israel that he will be with you. What? That he will, he will be close to them. He will support them. He will guide them. He will uh, protect them and he will assist them. So Allah promised them that I am with you. You do what? If you establish prayer and you give zakah and you believe in my messengers and not only believe, do what? You support them and you loan Allah a goodly loan. I will surely remove from you your misdeeds and admit you to gardens beneath which rivers flow. But those, but whoever of you disbelieves after that has certainly strayed from the soundness of the way. So in this verse number 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised three rewards for those who do five deeds. These five deeds are establishing of salah, paying off the obligatory zakat, and believing in prophets, supporting the prophets, and giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a goodly loan that is spending in the path of Allah charity beyond zakat. A person who does these five things, Allah promises what? That he will be a supporter, a helper, a protector for that person. And second thing is that Allah says that I will remove your misdeeds and I will admit you into Jannah. It has been reported in traditions that Prophet Sallallahu has told all of us that anybody who supplicates for Jannah thrice, then Jannah also intercedes for the supplicating person. <clears throat> And we also learn from uh, this verse that uh, establishing salah and paying of the obligatory zakat, this was not just obligatory for the followers of Prophet Sallallahu but was also made obligatory for the followers of the previous prophets also. And we also learn from the verse that it is not just believing in the prophets what is needed. We just do not need to believe in the prophethood of Prophet ﷺ, but we need to do what? Help, support in the preaching, in the teaching, and in the implementation of the beloved religion of Prophet ﷺ. So for the breaking of covenant, we cursed them and made their hearts hard. They distorted. They distort words from their proper usage and have forgotten a portion of that of that of which they were reminded and you still observe deceit among them except a few of them but pardon them and overlook their misdeeds indeed Allah loves the doers of good and from those who say we are Christians we took their covenant but they forgot a portion of which they were reminded so we caused them animosity and hatred until the day of resurrection and Allah is going to inform them about what they used to do O oh, people of the scripture, there has come to you our messenger, making clear to you much of what you used to conceal of the scripture and overlooking much. There has come to you from Allah a light and a clear book. 
by which Allah guides those who pursue his pleasure to the way of peace and bring them out from darkness into the light and by his permission guides them to a straight path. Allahumma ikhtina sirat al-mustaqeem. Allahumma alhimna rushdan wa aizna min shururi anfusina. Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi nura wa fi sam'i nura wa fi basri nura wa an yameeni nura wa an yassari nura wa fawki nura wa tahti nura wa imami nura wa khalfi nura. Allahumma ja'al fi nura. And they have certainly disobeyed who say that Allah is Christ, the son of Mary, Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. Say, then who could prevent Allah at all if he had intended to destroy Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, or his mother, or everyone on the earth. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them. He creates what he wills and Allah is over all things competent. But the Jews and the Christians say, we are the children of Allah and his beloved. Say, then why? Why does he punish you for your sins? Rather, you are human beings from among those he has created. He forgives whom he wills and he punishes whom he wills. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them. And to him is the final destination. So in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is negating all the wrong faith and belief which the Jews and the Christians, they had fabricated regarding finding and making, uh, making the prophets, making and considering their prophets as deities and sons and offsprings of Allah. As the Christians said, وَقَالَتِ النَّسَارَ Isa ibn Allah so all these wrong beliefs and faiths of polytheism fabricated by the Christians and by the Jews, they are being negated and they are being invited to obey, to follow and to believe and accept the invitations extended to them by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. O people of scripture, there has come to you our messenger to make clear to you the religion after a period of suspension of message messengers but the period of suspension of messengers has been mentioned here and allah says that this uh, prophet Salaam, has been sent after the period of suspension of messengers why lest you say there came not to us any bringer of good tidings or a warner, but there has come to you a bringer of good tidings and a warner, and Allah is over all things competent. So what do we mean by this period of suspension of messengers? There is a period which is mentioned in the Maki Surahs as Fatratun, Fatratul Wahi. That was what? A period of suspension of revelations to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is what? Fatratun Nabuvat, a period of suspension of messengers. This period was a time before the advent of Islam, before the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being selected in the locality of Makkah. Because we realize that in Mecca, after Hazrat Ibrahim salam, and Hazrat Ismail salam, for full 40 generations, for 2,500 years and 40 generations passing after Zabiullah and Khalilullah, was there no prophet? There was no prophet, there was no down, uh, divine scripture sent down on the earth for the people of Mecca. And so after that was Prophet Sallallahu was chosen from within the people of Makkah. And that was obviously as an answer to the supplication of Hazrat Ismail, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Rabbana babas fihim rasulim minhum yatlu alayhim ayatika wa yuallimuhum ul kitaba wal hikmah wa yuzakihim innaka antal alimul uh, azizul hakim. So this was uh, full 2,500 years after the prophethood of Hazrat Ismail and Hazrat Ibrahim salam, in Makkah. As far as the people of Bani Israel in Palestine, Hazrat uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, uh, there was the birth of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was after 571 years after the death of Hazrat 
Isa alayhi salam. 571 AD is the birth of Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. And still more than that, 40 years beyond that is he blessed, was he blessed by prophethood. So like full about a uh, quarter and a half, six centuries was Prophet Salavalism's prophethood after Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So there in the family of Bani Israel, there was no prophet for about 620 or more years. And in the family of Bani Ismail, there was no prophet or divine scripture sent for about 2,500 years. So this period of suspension of messengers has been mentioned here. Why was this uh, prophethood and, this, and the revelations of the divine scriptures, they halted and they suspended? We understand the wisdom from commentaries is one was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to build up the thirst. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to build up the thirst for the knowledge and for the true divine guidance, the knowledge, the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the mankind to become thirsty for the knowledge of truth, for the true guidance, for the nur and light of Allah that Allah want to make and build up the desire. It's just like when you, the, when you know that it doesn't rain for a long period and when it starts raining after a long period of suspension of rains, what happens is the first few drops are very, very readily absorbed. So before, before the prophethood of the seal of prophets, means Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and before the revelations of the final and the last and the completed and the perfected book of Allah, Allah wanted to build up this thirst. Allah wanted to build up this desire to find out the truth. Allah wanted to build up the immense and the intense desire of getting to the revelations and the nur of Allah before these final and the last verdicts of Allah was said. And second reason which we gather is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the mankind to go astray as much as it could. The wildest of dreams, the human beings could indulge in innovations and bidah and create and indulge in all forms of polytheism. The human minds in the wildest of dreams as much and as far to beyond the limits what they could indulge, they were led to go astray. So that once, finally, once finally by this al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raziitu lakum al islam adina this final perfected and completed religion all forms of poly polytheism the human mind could could or had invented or all forms of innovations which human mind could invent they were once for all negated by these complete teachings of quran hadith and sunnah ربنا لا تزع قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسكون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين